morning, good morning, good evening, um, whatever time you may be tuning in to this Sunday School Review. Um, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you first and foremost for this opportunity uh, to come before you right now. I ask God that you would strengthen. God, I pray that you would empower. I pray for every listener right now. Whatever need they stand in need, help them to know, as well as myself, Lord, that you are always the answer. You are the answer to all of life's questions. Help us to lean and depend on you and help us to rest in your faithfulness. Save the unsaved that may be listening. Help them to hear the gospel and believe today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you so much for tuning in uh, to our Sunday School Review. This is Frederick Robinson, youth pastor of the Liberty Missionary Baptist Church, where the Reverend Dr. Clyde May Jr. is the pastor. We thank God for our being here. We thank God for Pastor May, uh, a man who rightly divides the word of God and has a heart for God's people. Um, to my church family, I love you. I thank you for your continued prayers and support. Um, to my wife, April, my daughters, Carly and Kaylee, I speak blessings over you. And to all of you who are tuning in, uh, however you're tuning in, whatever platform of social media, um, I thank God for you as well. And we um, do not want to leave out Sarconi Prince, who also shares and helps balance out these Sunday school lessons. Thank God for you, Sakoni. We are constantly praying for you and your family. And thank God for you being a blessing to the body of Christ and to people everywhere. Amen. And we, we won't prolong the time. We're going to go ahead and go into our lesson, which is our Sunday school review lesson three. June 18, 2023. Our title is All for One and One for All. Our printed passage is Ezekiel 37, 21 through 28. Our key verse is Ezekiel 37 and 27, and it reads, My tabernacle or my dwelling place also shall be with them. Yea, yeah, I will be their God. And they shall be my people. All for one, one for all. Our lesson aim says, as, an as a result of experience in this lesson, the participants should be able to do these things. Number one, understand how the unity of God's people in the covenant of peace reveals God to us and to the nations. Number two, value unity over personal preference. And number three, grow to examine sources of disunity within the church and develop a plan for peace and harmony. Amen. What a, what a great goal. Amen. I am teaching out of the, um, the teacher's edition, the teacher's guide today. Uh, but if you have your Bible, you can turn to Ezekiel 37, verse 21. Uh, if you have your regular Sunday school books, um, it should be in some manner um, cohesive to that that book as well. All right, but our lesson in our, our lesson in focus says this: in one way or another, most people have experienced the disturbance or disruption of a significant personal relationship, even if only temporarily. There are ever-present complexities and challenges that come with living in community. God, however, has called his people to live peaceably with one another for the sake of love and for the sake of their witness to others. Although sin continues to cause division in marriages and families, institutions, governments, and communities, scriptures, frequently celebrate the blessing of unity among believers. Of course, we know 
the famous verse of um, Psalms 133 1 which says how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in in what in unity and I when I actually quote verses I love to actually go look at them um, to make sure we word for word behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity amen and for a bonus it says it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment it's a blessing It's like God pours a blessing down on unity. It's good and pleasant. Amen. Our scriptures today, um, as we go into our scriptures, God had called Ezekiel out. The hand of the Lord had carried him out in the valley and set him in the midst of the valley of dry bones and they were very dry and God told him to he asked him a question if these bones can live and he told him to prophesy to those bones and he prophesied to the bones and then he said prophesy unto the wind and breath came upon those bones and God showed him that these bones are the whole house of Israel and God was speaking life unto Israel because Israel was in a bad place and had disobeyed God. And God also had two, uh, two sticks and he told Ezekiel to bring those sticks together. And he was showing him that he was going to bring together Israel as the commentary will speak more on in just a minute because they had been divided. Amen. But he says in verse 21, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them, get this, one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all and they shall be no more two nations neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols nor with their detestable things nor with any of their transgressions but I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Amen. Commentary says God made five tremendous promises. Number one, he would restore them to their homeland. This restoration of God's people from every place carried far more weight than just the return from Babylon. It was a divine promise to restore Israel's nation, national unity. Number two, God would purify the people from idolatry. This prophetic message speaks to the, of the new covenant. No one has the power to purify themselves. Now, the law of Moses was a guide, but it had no power to create righteousness in the human heart. God vowed to cleanse his people and renew a spiritual fellowship with them. The verse also pictures the promise of salvation through Christ and consecration by the power of the Holy Spirit. Number three, David would rule as king over them. At this time, David was already deceased. This was not a resurrected David. Instead, it refers to David's royal lineage fulfilled in the person of the Messiah, Jesus. 
He is the rightful spiritual heir, one who will rule forever on the throne of spiritual Israel, God's eternal kingdom. Um, and I highlighted this part because I thought it was very important. It says the messianic prophecy points directly to Jesus as the rightful heir to the throne of David. He is the people's shepherd, the righteous king, and Davidic ruler who redeems and unifies the redemption and restoration of God's people in their homeland have physical and spiritual significance. These events will have their final fulfillment at the end of the age. And this is good news. This is good news. Um, as we look at this lesson, a couple things jumped out um, as we're talking about uh, one for all and all for one all for one and one for all it says that there's one stick it says in this chapter that there'll be one nation there'll be one king both of those in verse 22 and then verse 24 he says they shall they all shall have one shepherd one shepherd that's four times god says one and then in verses 22 through 24 you see uh one king shall be king to them all neither shall they divide it into two kingdoms no more at all but i will save out of all their dwelling places and they all shall have one shepherd it was all for one but it was one for all this is so important because God was telling Israel that he was going to redeem them because they had been scattered and they were divided into two nations but God was saying I'm going to bring you back together as a matter of fact he said it clearly when he said and one king shall be king to them all and they shall be no more two nations neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all that means that somebody may say what is that what does this portion right here mean to me what this means to us is it's a question that the apostle paul asked um the the children of God in Corinthians he asked this question when one of them was saying I'm of Apollos I'm of Paul I'm of Christ they were they were there were Christians who were saying they were following different people and Paul said I'm glad I baptized none of you none of the people who were speaking he said besides a couple people he said that Christ didn't call him to baptize but he called him to preach the gospel but the question that's on the floor today is is Christ divided we got so much division in the world we got what they call black churches and white church oh that's a white church oh that's a black church is Christ divided Oh, that's a Baptist church. What, what are you? Are you Baptist? Or are you Catholic? I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Is Christ divided? Many of us are wrapped up in denominations instead of being wrapped up in Christ. You won't get into heaven based off your denomination. As a matter of fact, God, I don't believe, will even bring up your denomination. He said in his word, there's many that will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I do many wonderful works in your name? And the Bible declares that he will say to them, depart from me, you that work iniquity, for I never knew you at the end of the day this lesson is so important to us because the question is 
do we know Christ and does he know us? It's all for Christ and Christ for all. It's, in other words, it's all about Jesus. And it's hard to operate in the spirit of God. As, as a matter of fact, I believe it's impossible to truly be walking in the spirit of God and be divided because God had, Jesus had his disciples together. Did they always agree? No. Two of them came and say, Lord, let, let us sit on your right and left hand. We come into the kingdom and the other disciples became jealous. But Jesus broke that down real simple and quick and easy. He said, he who is greatest among you will be your servant. <laughs> Amen. You want to be great in God's eye, then get out and serve somebody. He say, that's who going to be the greatest. He say, but it's not given. I'm not the one who choosing where y'all sit, but y'all going to drink the cup that I drink and you will be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But he say, but to sit on my right and left hand, that ain't none of my, that ain't what I'm here for. In other words, I'm here to save. I'll let God the father decide who sit on my right and left hand. But Christ was focused on his mission. And the question is, are, are we, or are we divided? One of our lesson aims, and we're going to move on, was to understand how the unity of God's people in the covenant of peace reveals God to us and to the nations. God is showing us in this lesson, people of God, that he wants a unified church. Why would the world come into the church if we divide it? And some people won't come into the church because they see it. And you know what? I'll say this and I'll move on. There may be some people who are listening and you, you go to a church that is unified. But what are you doing to help? others who are confused one of my greatest passions is to see a unified church amen on one accord all about the Lord Jesus Christ and not about what color you are what kind of hairstyle you got what kind of clothes you wear how old you are how young you are you listen to this kind of music we do this kind of praise and worship and this and that and that and this and that and the enemy uses it to divide us oh that god would cause us to walk in the spirit and in his word and everything else will fall in line amen next section says and they shall dwell in the land that i have given unto jacob my servant wherein your father have dwelt and they shall dwell therein even they and their children and their children's children forever and my servant david shall be their prince forever watch this moreover i will make a covenant of peace with them it shall be an everlasting covenant with them and I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people and the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them evermore he say even the heathen gonna know that i sanctify israel when my sanctuary is in the midst of them the reunion and restoration of israel would not have would not happen in secret god made a public showing of what he was doing for his people in the remaining verses, God adds more blessings to his list of promises. Number four, God will establish an everlasting covenant of peace with his people. Hallelujah. One that cannot be broken or vacated. 
God will gather his people and shelter them in a place of perfect peace that is marked as unprecedented generational longevity. Lastly, God, number five, God will dwell among his people. The, the temple, God's dwelling place, shall be sanctified by God's holy presence. Verse 27 used the word tabernacle and literally denotes higher ground. Both translations hint at protection, whether spiritual or physical. God comes down to dwell with man, transforming earth into heaven. Ezekiel pictures the rebuilding of the temple. This prophecy was first fulfilled with the construction of the temple built by the returning exiles. Stay with me now. And its final fulfillment had not been met because Israel had failed to meet the conditions. Scholars believe that its future or second fulfillment lies, lies in the ingathering of a converted Israel into the body of Christ. It looks forward to the time when the tabernacle of God will be with his people. Ezekiel gives a fuller description of the sanctuary in chapter 40 through 48. I highlighted this section. For believers in every generation, there's no deliverance from captivity without a return to the sanctuary. Or worship the dwelling of God with his people in worship is important to our existence and ability to stand and remain free from spiritual setbacks amen had a conversation with a friend of mine who's going through some things um, with his stepsons and um, I talked to my pastor about it and one thing he asked me was were they churched do they have a church family, church home? And um, I come to find out that they didn't. And a lot of times God allows, he sends people to me to counsel them in the area of marriage. And um, most people that I talk to in marriage, if they're having marital issues, is that um, they aren't churched. Uh, going to church doesn't fix all your problems. Let me say that. But it helps. It helps. It helps. It's something that God does for a family that is under a covering. You may even be listening to me. and You may even be having marital issues. But let me encourage you. There would be more. If you didn't have a spiritual covering, somebody to pray over you, somebody to break down the word of God to you. God told Israel, they shall dwell in the land. They shall, this is a, listen to all these promises. They shall dwell in the land that I've given unto Jacob, my servant wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they <laughs> and their children. God's not just concerned about you. He's concerned about your children. Hallelujah. And their children's children, even your grandchildren, forever. And my servant David shall be prince over them. And we know that David would, was already deceased, so this was speaking of the Messiah who came through the lineage of David jesus christ he says moreover i'll make a covenant of peace with them this is an unconditional covenant because he says i will make a covenant they didn't listen we didn't initiate the covenant i'm closing out now but 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 god chose to send jesus we the bible says god demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. Amen. We wasn't even um, in, we were, God sent Jesus Christ to us when we were sinners. Y'all, excuse me, I'm going to cut the speaker off because it's distracting. I know it ain't nothing but the devil. Listen, but the devil is a lie. God sent Jesus when we were in our sins. We hadn't lifted one finger. We couldn't even do nothing. 
And God makes this unconditional covenant. He said, I'll make a covenant of peace with them. And like, I love this. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. It's not going to run out. I'm not going to go back on it. God's not a covenant breaker. We are. We break covenants. We break marriages. We break vows. We break rules. We break God's law. But God is a promise keeper. He's a covenant keeping God. If God promised you something, you keep standing on what God promised you. If you've been praying to God and you believe in God and you standing on his word, Keep standing on his word. Don't let nothing change you. Don't let nothing move you. Circumstances may change. Situations all around you may change. Your wife or husband may change. Your children may change. Your health may change. Situations may change, but don't you move off of God's promise. Because God cannot lie. And that's why the enemy don't want us to get into this word. Because it'll tell you all for one and Christ is for everybody. He said, I will place them. I will multiply them. I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. That's what I love about God. God didn't wait for us to come up. He came down. And that's why we that's what we got to do to the people who are lost, the people who don't know Christ. We waiting for them to come up, but God waiting on us to go to them. My God almighty. God say I'll come down. I'll be I'll be their God and they shall be my people. Mm. That's how much he loves us. He said, they're going to be my people. I'm proud of them. I'm going to put my robe of righteousness on them. I'll take their sin through my son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross, and I'll put my righteousness on them. And the heathen shall know. <laughs> The world shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. I put him in <clears throat> forevermore. I put in my notes, who can stop God? <laughs> when God got his mind made up to do something, who can change it? Amen. Don't think so highly of yourself to think you can stop the plan that God has for your life. Sometimes we spend too much energy worrying about things that we can't control. And I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to Frederick, too. I spend a lot of hours worrying about things that are out of my control. And I got to imagine somebody listening to me does, too. But my encouragement to myself and to you is to let God handle the things that you can't control. Somebody say, what is that? The future is in the hands of God. You can do what you can do for God today, but there's nothing you can do today, right now, that'll change tomorrow, right now. Now, God bless us with tomorrow, then we be faithful with tomorrow. And the decisions that we make today can affect tomorrow, but right this second, you can't reach into tomorrow and change something because we don't even know if we're going to get it. But we can sow seeds today that will affect our tomorrow for change. And I hope you can see the difference. And Lord knows we can't reach back in the past. We can't. We, that's done. But we can make decisions today. Even if you messed up your whole life. You might be messed up right now. But you can make one choice to follow Jesus. One choice to say yes to him. You Listen, you can be then said no your whole life, but one yes. 
can change your life forever. Amen. Let me close out now. Our lesson uh, says, consider the your life section says, consider the many covenants we make with one another. Car loan, wedding vows, mortgage. What makes the agreement binding? What validates it and makes it enforceable? How significant to you is your spiritual covenant with God? Amen. You know, in those covenants, we sign paperwork and we read the fine print, hopefully. I know a lot of us sometimes skip over it. I have. But the fine print is important. And in our covenant with God through Jesus Christ's death on the cross, the Bible is all the promises. Many of us are getting beat over the head by the enemy because we don't know what we've been promised. We don't know who we are. Sons and daughters of the Most High God, name written down in heaven, redeemed, blood bought, blood washed, accepted, beloved, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Guarant this Holy Spirit is the guarantee, the down payment that God is going to finish the work that he started in us and we're walking around afraid, nervous, anxious, thinking that God is not going to do what he said he's going to do. But I'm like Paul. He who hath begun a good work in us shall complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. One, all for one and one for all. My prayer is that we would be unified in Christ and to stop allowing Satan to divide us with stuff that don't really matter. God told Israel, I'm coming back and I'm going to bring us all together. And I heard in Revelations, John said that God is going to come back. Jesus Christ is going to come back. I'm going to I'm going to read this and then we're going to close in prayer. I pray that you've been blessed by this lesson. I pray that it's encouraged your heart. John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, there it is, is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. We're going to get to see him, y'all, and be their God, and God shall wipe away. You don't even have to lift a finger. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. The former things are passed away. Last verse. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. Let's pray. Dear Lord, please rekindle the fire within us that we may shine for your glory as witnesses before the entire world. Remove all fear and all doubt. Build our faith and determination as we serve you. For Lord, we love you and we thank you. Thank you for your people. Thank you for this Sunday school lesson. Keep us as we go about. And oh God, set us on fire and let it burn for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, this is Frederick Robinson, Youth Pastor, Liberty Missionary Baptist Church, where the Reverend Dr. Clyde May Jr. is the pastor. Pray something's been said to encourage your heart. All for one, one for all. That issue in your family, any disunity in your marriage, 
any disunity with your children, any disunity with people on your job, any disunity within yourself, the answer is found in the word of God. Spend some time there and watch what God do. Y'all be blessed. Thank you for tuning in. Till next time.